Hi everyone, um, so I'm going to do something a little bit different to what you are usually used to. Um, so my name is Chloe Start, I'm going to, as Gordon said, I'm going to introduce today my project which is entitled RNAi Media Knockdown of Essential Central Nervous System Genes in um, Spotrel Aeropolis. Um, so first I'll talk about um, food security and the issues that we face with this. Um, so currently more than 10% of people are chronically undernourished worldwide. Um, and with an expected population of 9.7 billion by 2050, this figure is likely to increase. Um, unfortunately, the land that we do have for crop production is finite and decreasing due to things such as residential, recreational and commercial land use. Um, so we must try to utilise the land that we do have to its full potential. But unfortunately, um, crop productivity is reduced by many abiotic and biotic factors such as insect pests. <clears throat> So what is the pest insect that I'm working with? So this is Spidoptera lateralis, um, which is a highly polyphagous lepidopteran pest, <coughs> which has four life stages. The first is the egg stage, and then the larvae stage, which has six different instars, and then the adult, st the pupae stage and the adult stage. So Spidoptera lateralis um, attacks more than 80 species of economic importance, such as maize and wheat, but also um, one of the most nutritionally important um, crop species in um, low to middle income countries, which is Solanum lycopersicum or the tomato. <clears throat> um, so the most damaging um, life stage of Spidoptera lateralis is um, the late larvae stages, <clears throat> which feed mainly on the leaves and um, cause large leaf holes and also lead, um, lead to the leaves um, being susceptible to secondary infection from bacteria and fungi. Um, they also go on to feed onto the tomato fruit, which can leave it either unsuitable for consumption or actually lead to a complete 100% um, yield loss of this crop. Um, so there are some current control strategies, and this includes the use of chemical insecticides, um, but these unfortunately threaten non-target insects and also the environment, and also insects do have ways to um, become resistant to these insecticides, which either renders them less effective or completely ineffective. <coughs> So now I'm going to go on to talk about an alternative control strategy, which I've been um, working on, and this is called RNAi. Um, so what actually is RNAi? Um, so it, it is a natural mechanism um, used by most eukaryotes, which actually regulates gene expression, but it also um, works as a defence against things such as pathogens and viruses and um, transposons. Um, but we as scientists can actually hijack um, this system and essentially knock down genes of our own choosing in a specific organism, also of our own choosing. So to do this, um, we must first synthesise something called long double-stranded RNA, which I'm not going to go into how you do it, but it's a series of rather complex steps. But basically, you make this long double-stranded RNA in um, the lab. Um, and essentially, you introduce this into your insect, so Spodoptera lateralis in this case, um, by two main methods, which is either via an artificial diet or via um, injection. <clears throat> so we introduce this long double stranded RNA, and the system basically recognizes it as an invading molecule, which it seeks to destroy, um, as if it's a virus. Um, and essentially, an enzyme called DISA um, comes along and chops up the long double stranded RNA into much shorter sequences, um, which are also double stranded. Um, so these two strands then become unwound. One's called the passenger strand, which is immediately cleaved or gotten rid of, essentially and the other um, is called the guide strand. <clears throat> so this guide strand actually gets incorporated into something called, um, it's a protein complex called the RIS complex, um, where it becomes a template for any mRNA that is transcribed from our gene of interest to bind to, and that binding leads to the triggering of um, the catalytic component of this RIS complex, which is the Argonaut 2 gene. And essentially, so any mRNA that is transcribed from our gene of interest um, cannot be translated into a functional protein which essentially means that if we choose a fundamental, um, a gene that is fundamental to the insect survival, then we can actually go on to kill that insect. Um, so which genes did I actually then go on to target? <coughs> Oops, sorry. Um, so before I go on to which genes they were, I'm going to talk a little bit about the insect central nervous system so I can try and show how these genes um, fit in. So the insect central nervous system is mainly um, comprised of a brain, ventral nerve cord, and ganglia which contain motor neurons um, and these motor neurons essentially receive and transmit impulses um, to a muscle cell which allows a response from the insect such as feeding or um, just movement and through a cascade of um, 
complex steps, which I'm also not going to go into, um, but including various ion channels, such as sodium ion channels. Um, this leads to a neurotransmitter, which in this case will be acetylcholine, being released into the synaptic cleft, which is essentially the area between the motor neuron and the um, muscle cell. So then the, this acetylcholine um, diffuses across the synaptic um, cleft and binds to nicotinic receptors on the muscle cell, which essentially allows the muscle to contract. Um, and this transmission then only is able to end um, when this acetylcholine is broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. <clears throat> so the genes that I've chosen um, are all actually targets of current insecticides. Um, so <clears throat> the first gene is ACE1, which is a target of organophosphates. The second is para, which is a target of pyrethroids. And the third is um, the NACHR, which is a target of spinosins. And essentially, um, all of these insecticides kill the insect by first causing paralysis, then essentially stops them feeding, and then causes them to die. Um, so the expected outcome that I wanted, essentially, um, when I targeted, um, when I used RNAi to target the genes, was um, that I wanted the same thing um, as that occurs with insecticides, so paralysis and death, but without the environmental safety concerns that we have with insecticides. Um, and that is due to the careful design of double-stranded RNA at the beginning of the project, um, which I also opened. Um, but so the experimental work I did, I started off by synthesizing this long double-stranded RNA, which I then administered to the insects either via an artificial diet, um, direct injection, or gavagin, which is essentially force feeding. I then went on to look at things such as um, mortality, um, changes in pupation, and also adult emergence, and also some gene expression changes. And um, I got a lot, of, quite a lot of data, but I'm not going to go into everything. Um, but something that was quite interesting was that um, when I injected double-stranded RNA into <coughs> third instar larvae, um, the double-stranded RNA that was specific to the para gene actually caused um, these insects to delay their pupation. So um, six days after para injection, well, double-stranded RNA specific to the para gene was injected, 0% um, of insects actually pupated, compared to the artificial diet when nearly 40%. Um, and also when I injected um, double-stranded RNA of all of the four genes that I am, um, double-stranded RNAs that I synthesized, um, I found that the adult emergence was actually significantly decreased compared to um, when insects were fed on an artificial diet. But <clears throat> the mortality that I talked about that I was expecting actually did not occur. So there were delays, but they didn't actually die. Um, and that, so I went, then went on to look at why this could be. <clears throat> and I found that double-stranded RNA is actually degraded by nucleases in the Spodoptera literalis, hemolymph, and gut juice. Um, so this is essentially just a gel <clears throat> which shows um, double-stranded RNA incubated in pure hemolymph and then two different dilutions. And um, I'll not go into too much detail, but essentially lane two should show a, five, a little band at the 500 base pair um, region, which is the size of a double-stranded RNA. And the fact that it isn't actually there in lane two um, shows that there is complete nucleus degradation of this double-stranded RNA. And then in lanes five, six, and seven, which is incubation in the mid-gut juice, um, you can see that the 500 base pair band is not in any of those lanes, <clears throat> which shows that even with really quite large dilutions, um, double-stranded RNA just isn't stable in the mid-gut juice, um, which does actually provide evidence for why there may not have been um, an the mortality effect that was expected. Um, but I then went on to try and increase um, double-stranded RNA stability. <clears throat> um, and I did this using nanocarriers, which is something that has actually been done before. Um, and in this case, so there are different nanocarriers, but in this case, I went with um, chitazan. <clears throat> and this gel essentially, so lanes two, four, six, and eight show basically what I showed on the last slide. So double-stranded RNA um, incubated in different hemolymph dilutions. Um, but these are different dilutions, basically. Um, lanes three, five, seven, and nine then show the double-stranded RNA chitazan complex that I formulated. Um, so, in, two, in lanes 2, 4, 6, and 8, you can show that with increasing, um, increasing dilutions, the double-stranded RNA becomes more stable. And also in lanes 3, 5, 7, and 9, although the, um, 
bands are actually stuck in the wells at the top of the gel, um, which they shouldn't be. Um, that is just because chitosan is such a large molecule, so it didn't diffuse through the gel. Um, but you can actually see in the wells at the top that when we are increasing the dilutions, um, the bands are becoming more intense, which does show that there may be some of the protection that we were hoping for being offered. So there is still some hope for the use of RNAi in this species. <clears throat> um, so I then went on to look at um, the effect of this double-stranded RNA on a non-target beneficial insect. And in this case, I chose a bee species, which is Bombus terrestris. Um, and I actually found that all of the double-stranded RNA molecules that I had synthesized um, were significantly less toxic than one of the most currently used pesticides on the market today. But then I did actually go on to see whether the double-stranded RNA is stable in the Bombus terrestris midgut juice. And actually, as you can see from lane two, it isn't. Um, it is being degraded, but to a much lesser extent than it is in the Spropterolaralis midgut juice. Um, I then also went on to do an extensive bioinformatics review, which indicated, so it's essentially, um, it indicated non or low sequence similarity between the double-stranded RNA molecules that I had designed and sequences within non-target beneficial insects. Um, so in conclusion, um, RNAi can be used to reduce the expression of genes of our own choosing. Um, and if we target a gene that is fundamental to survival, it can actually lead to mortality of that insect. Um, but unfortunately, Lepidopteran insects, such as Spidoptera oralis, are very recalcitrant to RNAi due to the presence of nucleases, amongst other things, um, in the hemolymph and juice. Um, but we can, there are actually ways of protecting this long double-stranded RNA, and therefore there are possible, um, there is still a possibility of using this technology in this species in the future. I also just wanted to say that um, this technology can be applied to various different crop um, species. It doesn't just have to be tomatoes, it doesn't just have to be Spidoptera lateralis. Um, so things as northeastern um, crops, such as oilseed rape. Um, and also I just wanted to point to um, a the, so it's by Greenlight Biotech, it's a sprayable double-stranded RNA pesticide and basically it incorporates double-stranded RNA into this spray um, to target the Colorado potato beetle. So it's basically a, um, to protect potatoes. So it's basically um, just a real-life example of what I've been talking about. And that's it. So that was very fast. <laughs>